Second Chronicles 26. Then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in the room of his father Amaziah. He built Eloth and restored it to Judah. So evidently this city was taken over. They took it back after the king slept with his father. Sixteen years old was Uzziah when he began to reign. And he reigned fifty and two years in Jerusalem. That's much years. And his mother's name was Jechiah of Jerusalem. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Good. According to all the father Amaziah did. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah. Who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, there's trouble. God made him to prosper. Now, who is the Zechariah? It's not the Zechariah, the writer of the book, Zechariah. But look at chapter 24, verse 20. Chapter 24, verse 20. And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people and said unto them, Thus saith God, there's a vision, which transgressed the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord, he has also forsaken you. And Joash the king has him killed. So, I, I mean, hey, wow, look at that, he's killed. He gave me that note. He's been dead by now. Uh, I guess there's another Zachariah. It can't be that one. That one was killed. That's a note someone gave me up wrong. We all have mistakes. I've done mistakes. Who had understanding the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, again, important, that's important, God made him to prosper. And he went forth and warred against the Philistines. They're not as bad as, as the time of King Saul and David, but they pop in. They're an enemy of Israel and break down the wall in Gath. That's where Goliath came from. And the wall of Jebus. And the wall of Ashdod. And he built and he built cities about Ashdod among the Philistines. So he goes in there conquering the cities of Philistine and he's building Judean or Judah towns. In the enemy's area. You know, we conquest, we're going to put troops here, we're going to put people here, we're going to keep our eyes on you. And our military does that. We have military outposts and bases for the Army, Navy, Marines, and the uh, Air Force and the Coast Guard all over the, country, all over the world. On places that are allies and places where our enemy. So it's nothing new here. And God helped. Him against the Philistines. See God helping him? You see him getting victory? And against the Arabian. That's Ishmael. That's a definite enemy of Israel. That's an enemy that God said of Ishmael to Hagar, the mother. He said, listen, this guy is going to be against everybody. And everybody is going to be against him. And God said, you get victory over the Philistines. You get victory over those Arabians. And dwell in Ger Baal. What was that Baal? It's a false god. And the uh, Mehums. And the Amorites, that's a lot, gave gifts unto Uzziah. <laughs> We're not going to mess with you. We'll just give you some gifts and pacify you and behave yourself. We'll behave ourselves. And his name spread aboard, even to the entering of Egypt down south, southwest. So the name of Uzziah, but God helping him is like, God's working with that guy. Don't go mess with him. Behave yourself. And he strengthened himself exceedingly. Four of Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate. So you can look out, you can see. And at the valley gate. And at the turning of the wall, fortify them. You can find these gates in Nehemiah in their order that they fixed them. And you'll find some of these towers listed in Nehemiah. And he built towers in the desert. So you can see the enemy coming. And dig many wells. You need wells for water. Water for surviving. For he had much cattle. He was a cowboy. 
both in the low country and in the plain. Husbandmen too also, and vine dressers, that's the only place dressers showed up, men who take care of the vine, prune it, weed it, pick it, in the mountains, and in Carmel, for he loved husbandry, and that's the first time husbandry shows up in the Bible, and here is his eye, he loves that work, he meant, and I would assume by saying he loved it, not only did he pay men to do it, but it looks like he may have done it himself. So that's a little interesting thing that God tells us. Moreover, Uzziah had a host of fighting men, an army, that went out to war by bands. Thou shalt not kill. There you go. According to the number of their account by the hand of Jehiel, the scribe, and Messiah, the ruler, scribes the one that records. He writes down stuff. He may even written what we're reading now. And it'd be like, take the scribe, okay, how many this son? Okay, how many that family? How many this? That's their job. Scribes are in charge of the Bible. Make sure, you know, if this, if this is getting worn out, it needs to be rewritten, you have to do it specifically. A scribe is somebody, you have to do it right. And like editors today, you would have your work be checked. Make sure you got it right. Proof. You just can't write things down and just let it be. And a ruler, somebody in charge. The hand of Hananiah, one of the king's captains, military. The whole number of the chief of the fathers of the mighty men of valor were 2,600. And under their hand was an army. 300,000 and 7,000 and 500 that made war with mighty power. Not power, mighty power. And helped, God helped, here's the military helping the king against the enemy. So the king has been protected by his army being protected by God. God used the army to help protect the king where we see God helped him and the army helped him. So when you say God says, you know, thou shalt not kill and I can't go into military service, you got a contradiction in the scriptures. Because these army men, what are they going to do? How did they defeat the Philistines? They had to kill Philistines. So there's definitely, when you say wartime killing, it's not what the context of thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill, when you look at the scriptures, it's somebody who wants to kill somebody on purpose with a reason. When you're in military, listen, you don't pull that trigger, that guy's going to pull the trigger. If you don't swing that sword, the other guy's going to swing the sword. And in wartime, it's pretty much protecting yourself as the government sends you out. That's why Romans 13, Paul says, if the government tells you to do it, do it. Do it in the name of Jesus Christ as a Christian. And Uzziah prepared for them throughout all the host, shields, that's a protection, and spears, you throw spears, and helmets, that's the first helmets in the Bible, you put them on your head, and the only other helmets in the Bible, oh, I guess, it would be Jeremiah 46, 4. And habergeons. That's the first time that word shows up. Habergeons. I believe it's, I don't forget what that one is. And bows, you know, bow and arrow. And slings, like David had his sling, to cast stones. That's the military armament of the Old Testament of Chronicles listed right there. Everything right there is what they had. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have guns. It's what they had. And he made in Jerusalem engines. That's the first time that word shows up. Engines. And the only other place is Ezekiel 26, 9. Engines. Invented. That is the only place in the Bible. Invented. By cunning, that means men of it, men that know something. They have knowledge, wisdom, or understanding. They're smart men. So this guy started, I mean, he's got catapults. 
something. Just watch. To be on the towers that he built upon the bulwarks to shoot arrows with great stones with all. This is a catapult kind of system that he's built. They're throwing rocks and they're throwing arrows at a mighty, mighty force. And his name spread far abroad. I bet you it did. Don't go against Jerusalem, man. You're going to have rocks flying at you. You think a guy shooting one arrow is going to be okay? This guy has got a machine that shoots arrows, 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 arrows. Leave him alone. For he was marvelously, that's the only time that word, that, that's the first time that word shows up, marvelously, helped. Look how help keeps showing up with him. God helped him. His army helped him. And he's been helped by God and his military. And he did that which is right inside of God. He had this man, Zechariah, uh, who had helped him out. And guided him in the ways of the Lord. As long as he sought the Lord. And we're going to look at somebody here. It's for the Christian. He's doing well. He is prospering. Now, yet, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. I mean, he's doing right. God is loving him. God is taking care of him. He's got problems. He's got situations. And we cannot, and we've seen this again, and this seems to be a, a, a theme that's been rolling out for the last three chapters. Don't think that just because you're doing right today, you're not going to fall tomorrow. Because you may fall. And this is the man's going to fall right now. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow for me. I don't know what, what the world and Satan will throw at me. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. I can't say I'm going to be bold and strong until the day I die for rapture. I'd be foolish. And at that moment, I do say, look how strong I am. Look how great I am. In that moment, the devil has already come in. He's not going to come in. He's already come in and destruction. And when a man or a church or a Christian starts getting up with pride and being proud and I'm great, I look what pride goes before a fall, the Bible says. But, that's a very important but. But we didn't finish verse 15. He was marvelously helped till he was strong. And run back to verse 5 again as he sought the Lord. But when he was strong, his heart lifted up to his destruction. That's pride. And I've seen many men, I've seen many Christians get into state, and you're not going to tell them anything. You're not going to dare to enter into their life and tell them what they're doing wrong because it's their job to tell you what, what you're doing wrong. And all you can do is pray for them. But again, I've said this over and over and over. With God, there is no pride. There's no being proud. God cannot lie. God cannot sleep. And God cannot be proud. Can God, do, can God not do anything? He cannot remember my sins under the blood. What will tear down a Christian? Adultery. Yeah, that'll tear down a Christian. Get involved in past sins and bringing it back. Yeah, that'll, that'll tear down a Christian. Pride will tear down a Christian. Pride has destroyed churches. Pride has destroyed countries. You look at the countries who are no more, who have failed. And there was pride how great we are. World War II, the Nazi. There is no nation like us. The, the English. The sun never sets upon the, the English Empire. The, the Japanese. Oh, you know, the sun. We're the great. We're, we're, we're the... And what are you today? You're not even four great nations today. You know, Satan, the Bible says in Ezekiel 28, Satan is the king over the children of pride. And when you fall in the realm of pride and being proud, you are a, if you're a Christian, you're still a Christian, you can't lose your soul, but you have changed the throne of God to put Satan on there by putting yourself. 
When he is strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God. It's his God. It is his Lord. And went into the temple of the Lord. That sounds good, doesn't it? Going to see the Lord. To burn incense upon the altar of incense. He's going to go into the holy place. He don't belong there. He's not a priest. And Zacharias, John the Baptist's father, is in the holy place at the incense altar, offering the incense to the Lord at the prayer of the people, while the people are outside, not inside. And then he sees his man. And he gets petrified. And I don't know, but I would think that Uzziah would come into the picture at least. Maybe, maybe not. Because what we're going to read right now is, if you do not vote, belong in this room, you are in trouble. Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's sons, went into the same room here and got the incense, the, the things, and put strange fires, and a fire came down from God and burnt them. You know what's remarkable about that, I, 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 when you study that? When they were in that, ho that holy place, there were badger skins, one I can remember. And there was other kind of skins, I could just remember the badger skins. That didn't burn. The covering of the holy place where those two sons were in the tabernacle that Moses met, one of them being badger skin, cloths of purple, I believe, was another one. They did not burn when that fire came down and melted those sons. Neither did their clothing. And I'm saying for Zacharias, and this may be off the wall, man, I could be wrong, but when you're in this holy place and you're dealing with that incense altar, it's got a bad history in the Bible. Two of Zacharias' family burnt up. And now here's a king going in there, and we're going to tell you, he's going to get leprosy. He don't belong there. And then when Zacharias turns around, here's a man is an angel, but you don't have one. Here is a man. He doesn't know he's an angel. Uh, what are you doing here? I'm Gabriel. And Azariah, the priest, went. All right, Azariah, you see that name there? That's the high priest. Now, Uzziah has two names in the Bible. Second Kings 14. This is interesting. I thought this was interesting. It may not be, but I thought it was interesting. 2 Kings 14 gives us his other name. Second Kings uh, 14, 17. And Azariah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, the king of Jehoah, king of Israel, 15 years, and then 15 won. And the 20th and 7th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Azariah. That's Uzziah. And when you read the story, we're reading the same thing, 15, that we're reading right now. All right, his name is Uzziah, his name is Azariah. Look at the name of the high priest, verse 17. And Azariah, they both got the same name. Notice in 2 Chronicles, when you're looking at Judah, we haven't seen Israel nor. I mean, it's mentioned when it referenced to Judah. But 2 Chronicles is more for Judah. 1 Chronicles is more for Judah. And when we come to it's about Judah, God gives the other name that's not the name that matches the high priest. God doesn't want you to think, oh, if I read about Azariah, it may be the priest's offering. No, it's not the priest's offering. It's the king. I thought that was interesting. Azariah the priest is going to say later, he's the high priest. Went in after him. And with him, four score priests. Eighty priests. Now listen, this guy is no weakling. Azariah calls in 80 more priests. Casey gives us a hard time. Listen, these men weren't wimps. 
They're strong men. They have muscles. I guarantee David had muscles. I guarantee Jesus prayed. The wimpy pictures had. I guarantee Jesus had muscles, man. He's climbing up and down mountains like they were nothing. 80 men, priests of the Lord, that were valiant men. <laughs> valiant. No ordinary priests. Now remember, all priests are Levites, not all Levites are priests. He calls in the priests. Why? They're going in the holy place. I ain't going to get anybody in that room that doesn't belong there. And they withstood Uzziah, the king. He doesn't belong there. And said unto him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord. You don't belong here. You don't belong at that altar. Now get out of here. There's a chance. You know, you just walk out. But to the priests, the sons of Aaron, run that to John the Baptist's father. God allowed him to be in there because he belonged there. So John the Baptist is of Levi. Not only of Levi, of Aaron. Because his father is in the, the incense altar offering in the holy place. And doesn't get no leprosy. That are consecrated, secured, put into the office to burn the incense. Go out of the sanctuary. Get out of here. For thou hast trespassed. You crossed the line. Neither shall it be for thy honor from the Lord God. All right. You want to offer the incense? You don't belong here. That is not your job. God is not going to honor you doing that. And when you get women in pulpits today, when the Bible said, they shall not usurp the authority of, but I'm doing the work of God. God said, no, you're not. Because I said, don't do it. And God says, don't do it. And then you do it. God, you're not going to get no honor. And when you witness and, and, and go out to lost people with the ways of the world, and God says, preach the gospel, and you don't preach the gospel, and you think you're going to get merit points, you think you're going to get a crown, you think you're going to get rewards, God says, no, there is no honor for you to do what I told you not to do. Oh, Christians are going to be shocked. Then Uzziah was raw, bad attitude, and had a censer in his hand to burn incense, as Ahab and Abihu. And while he was, who do you think you're going to tell me? I'm the king. The leprosy, the leprosy, specific leprosy, even rose up in his forehead. The same spot where Goliath was killed. The same spot where if you're going to receive the mark, you can do it in your right hand or you can receive it in your forehead. Quite interesting spot to get the spot of leprosy. Before the priests in the house of the Lord, they're standing there in the holy place. They're looking at him and that white spot is coming. Miriam got leprosy. Outside the tabernacle. God, remember, God said, hey, you guys get out here. Come here. Come out of there. I have a little problem with you. In the house of the Lord, where? From beside the incense altar. They're in the holy place, and he's got the leprosy. Watch Leviticus 13 play out. And Azariah, the chief priest, the high priest, and all the priests looked upon him. Look at Le Leviticus 13. Behold, he was leprous in his forehead, and they thrust him out from that man. They picked him up, they did something, he's gone. We ain't going to wait on you. You're gone. You're unclean. You're vile. You know, there are unclean people in churches today, and they won't remove them. There are people involved in abominable sins. All are welcome. The church is not the place for lost people. Yea, himself hasted also to go out. So when they thrust, they're pushing them out. And also. Now, I don't know if they showed him a mirror. A mirror wasn't allowed in there. You're not going to bring anything to that holy place. You're not supposed to. At this moment, he believed the priest and maybe felt something. I don't know if he could feel leprosy. At the moment, you get it. 
But it's something that they're thrusting him out, and he, he also, because he himself hastened also to go out. Because the Lord has smitten him, I can only even assume he felt something. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death. He never got healed. Leviticus 13, 14 speaks about if there's the healing. That never happened except for Naaman, the Syrian. That never happened to a Jewish person until Jesus came. And he told, it's so funny, I think it's the ten lepers. He told him, he said, go tell the priest and give your offering. You know what that would have done to the priests at the tabernacle, the temple? They would show, hi, we were lepers. Remember us? You saw us, right? Yeah, we, we looked at you. Where's your leprosy? Jesus got rid of it. You guys want to open up to Leviticus 13, 14? Tell me what I need to bring. That would have been the first time ever for those priests who had to, went to reverse their mind in Leviticus 13, 14 say, okay, what do we do for this? I haven't seen this before. They couldn't open the book for Le Leviticus 13, 14 for Naaman. He wasn't Jewish. Jesus healing those lepers would make the priest go back in the law and look. And make them think, hey, this has never happened before. One of our kings had leprosy, and he had it to his death. And when they have found the place of Uzziah's burial, there is an inscription on his burial place, and, and I, I forget what the, last, the words are, but to the fact is, this king is a leper, it's woe to you to open this tomb. And you can find that today, 2019. I don't need archaeology to prove the Bible. I believe the Bible. Archaeology helps you to see the Bible. And Uzziah the king was a leper unto the day of his death and dwelt in a several house. That means not the normal house. Being a leper, he's unclean. He's supposed to be outside the city gates. Maybe he built a house there. I don't know. Being a leper, he was cut off from the house of the Lord. Couldn't go back. And Jotham, his son, was over the king's house, judging the people of the land. Here is a king overreigning another king, as Solomon did with David. And we're not told how many years the overlap is. Now, Uzziah is still the king, but his son has taken over because no one could deal with Uzziah. He's unclean. And notice it says, judging the people. The king and the priests of the land of Israel had the job of judging. Now the rest of the Acts, Uzziah, first and last, did Isaiah. Who's that? The prophet. Who's that? The son of Amos. Isaiah's walking and living and breathing and being around the time we're right now writing about. Isaiah, the 66 books. Here he is. You know Uzziah got the truth because there's Isaiah. Isaiah spoke the truth and told the truth. So Uzziah slept with his fathers, death, and they buried him in, with his fathers in the field of the burial, that's the first time that shows up, burial, which belonged to the kings. For they said he's a leper, and Jotham's son reigned in his stead. Again, I told you, he had a burial place outside. The kings were there, but he's not buried with the king. He's got his own little place, and there's been a warning back to the door. You know, like how we have warning for radiation. We got a warning that this room, you don't want to go in there, it's contamination. So, here's a man, he did great, wonderful. The Lord helped him, his people helped him. He got in pride, and he fell. All have sinned come short of the glory of God. You got to be careful. You got to stay in the Word. You got to stay in prayer. You got to stay in fellowship. Don't ever step out in yourself. Do not ever step out with the devil. Because you're on the road of path of destruction.